Now, in this lecture segment, we'll look at the Unix system calls for binary file I.O. They're not C standard, but they're a good example, and other operating systems offer very similar calls. So, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what a system call is. We'll be looking at the text to binary example program, which uses several library functions for um, opening, uh, writing, and uh, closing a binary file. Uh, those are, for instance, um, open right there, and uh, write and close. These, in fact, are more than just library functions. They're system calls. A system call is a library function, but it's supplied by the operating system, for instance Unix, itself. To a rough approximation, an operating system is a big library of functions, system calls, for performing actions that require special privileges. These include opening, reading, and writing disk files, starting other programs, communicating over a network, and so forth. A typical OS provides several hundred different system calls. These are collectively termed the operating system kernel to differentiate these core functions from OS-related utility programs like, say, editors or compilers, which are actually independent C programs. Any action on your program's part that uses I.O. devices, the display, the keyboard, mouse, disk, network interface, etc., or that involves controlling other programs, starting them, pausing them, uh, arranging communication with them, terminating them, so forth, any of that requires a system call. Now, system calls look like normal functions, as you can see in the code here. But calling them involves shifting the CPU to a more privileged mode that allows hardware access and control over the MMU, a mode not normally granted to ordinary running programs. Now, the object code translation of a system call uses a special machine language instruction that says, in effect, call this operating system function and go to privileged mode. Now, you can't just say go to privileged mode. The instruction requires the call into the operating system kernel as part of granting the privilege. Otherwise, a malicious program could grant itself privileged mode and run anything it wanted. Your program gets the privileged mode, but at the cost of running an operating system system call, which can be presumed to behave responsibly. You know, question one, given this description, what would you guess is one of the last things every system call does regarding CPU mode uh, before returning to the non-kernel code that called it. Yeah, coming back from a pause there. Uh, pretty obviously, it's going to need to turn off privileged mode. The whole system is airtight. You can't get privileged mode while running your own code. You get it only when running operating system code, uh, which revokes it before returning to your code. Now, in most operating systems, the operating system kernel is mapped into each program's virtual memory. In Unix, it's often the final one gigabyte or so of space, with one physical copy of the kernel appearing in every virtual space in the same manner that several running copies of the same program may share the same physical copy of a text segment. Reference the earlier lecture on process space. But interestingly, the MMU does not allow your program to even read that area of your virtual space, let alone write into it, unless the CPU is in privileged mode. So you wind up with the sort of odd result that your program, in effect, includes the entire operating system kernel as a big library within its virtual memory space, but without having a private copy of it, sharing the copy with every other program, and without being able to even look at it. Uh, unless it shifts to privileged mode by jumping into kernel code that requires the program to behave responsibly. Now, this very brief discussion is just the tip of the operating system iceberg. A full operating system course would give you details on the mechanics of system calls, the design of an OS kernel, and so forth. So, having discussed system calls then, let's look at a program that uses a few. The text-to-binary program reads a textual file of student data an example of which is right here. Comprising an integer ID and then a string name and a double GPA for each student. 
as we see in the diagram, it writes out an equivalent binary file for which we show a binary dump in the diagram, and we'll have more on that binary dump later. Now, to start with, the program expects command line arguments for the name of the text file to read and of the binary file to create and write. The uh, command that we'll run is shown here in the diagram, uh, text to binary, students.in, students.out. Lines 16 through 19 check for the right number of arguments, giving an error message if needed, and ending the program with exit. Now, question two here. You've seen exit in prior C work, but where do you think the code for that function resides, given that it stops a running program? Coming back from a pause, as the question pretty much implies, exit is a system call, and its code resides in the operating system kernel. Very technically on Unix, it's a small library function that in turn makes a system call, but that's a detail we won't get into here. Starting and stopping programs is an operating system privilege. Your program isn't even allowed to kill itself without making a system call to do so. By the way, falling off the end of main results in an exit call that is automatically added by the, by the uh, compiler. Lines 21 and 22 open the text and binary files. Line 21 uses the familiar f open, but line 22 uses the system call open to open a binary file. We'll look at its parameters in a bit, but first an important question. If opening a file is an operating system privilege, then isn't f open also a system call? I mean, it opens a file after all. No, it's not. In fact, open is the only system call for opening a file. f open calls open. The standard I.O. library functions all ultimately call system functions to do the real file I.O. The standard I.O. library does all the translation to and from textual ASCII codes, which the binary I.O. system calls don't know how to do. But ultimately the ASCII codes get written to or read from files using the binary I.O. system calls, which can read and write raw ASCII data as easily as any other kind of data. We'll look much more closely at the standard library in an upcoming lecture. Now, the first parameter of open is the file name, as it is for fopen. The second parameter determines how the file is opened, in other words, for reading or writing or other possible options. That's the same as for fopen, but the second parameter of open is an int. It's not a string. Each bit in this flag int, as we'll call it, represents a different option. You pass an integer with 1 bits for the options you want, and 0 bits for the ones you don't want. The header file, fcontrol.h, supplies pound defines giving 1-bit masks for different options, which makes it easy to assemble a single int with the right 1 bits by simply oring together the relevant masks. On line 22 here we OR the O write only mask for write only file access, uh, the O create mask, or O create mask, I'm sorry, for creating the file if it doesn't already exist, and the O exclude mask, exclude, for insisting that the file not already exist when we open it. This prevents accidental overwrite of existing files. This pattern of using a flag int to express options with pound-defined masks you OR together to create flag int values is extremely common in system calls, something to get very used to. The convention of prefixing the defines to reflect the call to which they belong, like O underscore for open, is also ubiquitous. And here's question number three. Do some external research and figure out what bits to set in open's flag int in order to create a file if it doesn't exist, and if it does exist, to clear its current content so we can write new contents. And coming back from a pause, you still need the O create flag, but instead of the O exclude flag, you'd have an O trunk flag, meaning to truncate the file to zero size on uh, open. The third parameter of open is also an int expressing the file permissions to give any new file created by open. Uh, 
This does not modify permissions if you open an existing file. The bits here are just like those for the change mod command with which you should be familiar and that's why they're written in octal form. Whatever octal value you'd give change mod to set permissions for a file, you may use unchanged here as long as you add the C required leading zero to make it octal. In question four, look up change mod and set file X to have permissions RW dash, R dash X, and R dash dash using octal notation. Get the change mod, mod command to do that. And test this after you do it with ls dash l to see if you get the specified rwx r dash x r dash dash permissions. Coming back from a pause in which you went and did those commands, um, the command you would have used is change mod 654, that octal value, uh, x. And if you were creating a file with open and wanted that permission, you'd use 0654 as the third parameter. Now, assuming all goes well, open returns an integer file descriptor. Every file your program opens is labeled by a file descriptor number starting with zero. Any other system calls you make to work on that file, for instance to read or write data, expect the file descriptor as their first parameter. There's one for write, for instance, right there. If any error results from the open call, then the call returns a negative value, which we check on lines 25 through 26 here. Now, these lines give a generic error message, but each negative return value indicates a different type of error, so you can check the exact value to give specific error messages. And predictably, there are pound-defined constants for each such negative value, with names reflecting the error in question. So here's question five, a bit more external research. There's a lot of this as we get deeper into system calls. What is the defined constant for the negative integer that open returns if you use O exclude, but the file already exists? And is there a naming convention for these error constants? Coming back from a pause, the pound define is E exist. And all error constants start with E, capital E, for error. So in the next segment, we'll finish up the text to binary.c example.